Well, good evening, everyone. It is That Weems Guy back for another episode. And joining us for, I believe it's his third visit, is Dave Spalding. How are you doing, sir? I am doing well. How are you doing? I'm making it. I'm making it. Uh, I suspect our weather is still a little bit warmer here in Georgia than yours is up in Ohio. You would be wrong. We're in a, a, a uh, section of really good weather. Okay. It's sunny and probably in the 70s. Okay, that's what we are here. Yeah. It yeah. won't last, but that's yeah. where we are right now. Yeah. Also, I, talk- I, want to, I want to apologize for having kind of a croaky voice. I'm getting over a, a virus or a bug of some kind. Okay. I talked to a guy in Ohio last week, and he's not in your area. And I think he's closer to Cleveland, and they were significantly colder than what we were. Oh, yeah. That's the snow belt around just north of Columbus. Yeah. They, the weather changes drastically. Okay. All right. Well, you know, last we talked, uh, on the show anyway, uh, you were getting ready to head in to do your last two big 40-hour classes, and I think you had a, a pistol-mounted optics class scheduled and everything. You've done all those. A couple well, they of weren't 40-hour classes. classes. They were two-day classes. Okay. Well, you had your legacy classes coming up. Yeah. The, the legacy classes w- were a big success. I, they really worked out well. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year, I taught three classes. I helped Rich Nance with a class out in Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were they were very successful. I was very blessed. They, they all sold out. The uh, carry optics class had 40 people in it. Yeah. I had to hire three instructors to come help me with that. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, Lee, I was really gratified because I've been talking to people in the training industry, and I guess it's really down this year. Yeah. Um, there, there's a trend down just in the firearms industry in general. But I talked yeah. to people who used to fill classes months in advance that either were canceling classes mm-hmm. or they were getting just enough to make them go. Yeah. And uh, again, I think that's just the, the firearms industry in general. And you and I both know that national or world events could change that in a minute uh, if uh, people feel threatened or something like that. But uh, yeah, I I had a good year and it was uh, it was very helpful in that um, I'm pretty sure I'm done. Yeah. I just, I wanted to teach just enough to see if I was going to miss it. And I, I will miss the, I, well, I should say, I'll miss the good people. <laughs> I will miss all the people. I'll miss the good people, which the, these four classes we had this year, we had all good people. Yeah. And uh, it really, it, the carry optics class was, was very, very gratifying. All of those people. And I had like Eric Gelhouse showed mm-hmm. up and Kevin Michalowski from the USCCA. Rich Nance flew in from California. Uh, Eric wrote an article about it. Uh, uh, Kevin did an online uh, after action review of the class. So uh, it was uh, it, it was really good. But uh, it, it didn't make me like want to come out of retirement and get on the <laughs> It's, it's, it's made me an observer Mm -hmm. of all things combative pistol craft. And whenever we've made contact of late, that seems like what we always talk about this and that. And, and, you know, what, did you hear this? Did you hear that? What do you think of that? So I thought, you know what we ought to do? You and I ought to do a podcast where we talk about the things that we talk about in private. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you mentioned world events and you mentioned that it, enrollment tends to be trending down. Uh, what I'm hearing from from guys is or other trainers is that sign ups are a last second thing. Now, I haven't taught a lot this year just because of other things going on. And as the audience knows, I went back to graduate school for the first time didn't cure me. I decided I'd do it again. I don't know why. But uh, I did. That, that young David Cagle led me astray is what it is. Um, I had a class in September. And about the 1st of September, I was worried about it. And then all of a sudden, it filled up. 
Okay. And, you know, and it was kind of like a, all of a sudden it was like, okay, well, we got enough, we've got, we reached the minimum, we're good to go. And then it just kept going and kept going and kept going. And we almost completely sold it out. Now, was that a local class? Well, it was about three hours for me, but I would consider it still local. I was going to say, if you got to fly to it, mm -hmm. you got to know long before yep. that. Yeah. 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 This was a, just one I could drive to. And, yeah. Um, well, see, you could wait till the last minute. That's right. tough on a lot of traveling trainers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I get that from the student perspective, too, because I saw a student griping about, uh, rightfully so, I guess, they had bought a ticket to a class and then the instructor, when it, whatever the deadline is for, it, didn't have enough people, the instructor canceled the class. And the student was saying, I understand that the instructor's got to have a certain number of people to make the bottom line to make their training arrangements. But I also have to, sure. you know, I took time, I took time off from work. I bought all the stuff to go do the class, everything yeah. else. And that is, it's hard. It is. It's really hard to cancel a class. Yeah. I fortunately didn't have to do it very often in the later years. Mm -hmm. But when I first got the company going, you did. Yeah. I, I pretty much, if I couldn't, cover my travel expenses mm -hmm. i would cancel uh when you're trying to get the business going you yeah. you, you, you want to go at all costs if i could get enough to break even i would do the class as i was getting going i was renting an indoor range over in metro atlanta and there were several times i taught a class where i made 50 bucks profit and i yeah. and i well 50 bucks beyond what the rental fee costs and i still had to drive over there drive back my targets mm -hmm. everything else um and I drove all the way to Oklahoma and Texas a couple of times for just enough to break even. Yeah. And I decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. So I started setting a hard minimum and I haven't really had a problem hitting that minimum much lately. Mm -hmm. um, and what I typically do is if we're not, if we're below the minimum, I start communicating with students early. Say, hey, look, we're still, we're still three short of what, you know, what we need. And I haven't had one that I was going to travel to not make in a while. Now, I did have an event scheduled in October. Uh, matter of fact, it would have been this coming weekend um, that around the end of September, I only had one person signed up for. And I just went ahead and pulled the plug on it instead of waiting to see if I got a bunch of, of last second ones. Yeah. I mean, you got to, you got to, at, at some point, I, I understand in the current economy mm -hmm. people wait until the last minute before they spend the money but by the same token you you gotta know you're at least i mean i remember one time i took it in the hole about a thousand bucks mm -hmm. and i didn't want to do that again yeah you know so it, it it goes both ways and i certainly understand it but I think I think we're we're in agreement that the mm -hmm. training industry is down right now. It'll come back. Yeah, it'll bounce back. Plus, there's also more local people than ever. Mm -hmm. And if you think about somebody that just wants to get a, a pistol class, yeah. and they see this guy here that's doing it for a hundred bucks, yep. and guys like us doing it for four or five hundred bucks, yeah, yeah, yeah. like go to that local guy. Yeah, of course, here in Georgia, we no longer even have a requirement for a carry license. Uh, but before that, uh, before that, you could get the carry license without any training so that we didn't ever have that built in thing of, you know, you had students feeding in and having to meet a training requirement for, for the carry thing. Um, but, you know, the industry or whatever term you want to use for it, it's. I always call it volatile. Yeah, you know, people ask me when you know my sheriff was retiring and my time as chief was in. He's like, "Why don't you just go full time on the road?" And I said, like, "I can't put any faith in this thing to pay my bills. This is just always going to be a supplemental thing for me." But there's so many outside factors that come into play. When nine millimeter ammo went from under two hundred bucks a case to over four hundred bucks a case, and you were good if you I could find one. That well, I remember it. You know, you could find one. Uh, You're looking for every little round you can cut out of the lesson yeah. plan. Yeah. Uh, in September, 
excuse me, in February, word got out that federal was going to get rid of the eight pellet flight control from their from their catalog. And I immediately got on the horn and bite, let me back up for a second. That's supposedly not true. I don't want to trigger <laughs> another panic that just got out on the internet. Well, I ordered two cases from a law enforcement distributor. Mm-hmm. Freaking two cases would last me a long, long time. And they quoted me a six month delivery time. Well, September rolled around and I just reached out to the distributor and said, Hey, what what's our projected status now? It's been six months. Oh, another six months. You know, I ended up I ended up, you know, doing something else with that order. But it's the ammo supply is not back mm-hmm. where it used to was, you know, two, three years ago. And now we've got what's going on in Israel. We've got everything that's going on in Russia and the Ukraine, which doesn't impact us as much on the ammo market as what's going on in Israel does. Mm-hmm. But we just had one of the major U.S. manufacturers of ammo sold to a foreign entity. Yes. I read that the other day. And yeah. let's face it, Lee, lead, yeah. copper, yep. brass, the base level commodities. Mm-hmm. They're going up. Yep. So if, if you find it, matter of fact, I found, uh, I think it was Norma, 124 grain ball on sale for around 200 a case. Yeah. I, I bought a bunch. Yeah. Because I don't think I'm going to see it that low again. Yeah. I saw some advertised the other day for about 200 a, a case. Yeah. That's as low as I saw it. Was. Yeah. 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 And, you know, the, the Russians and the Ukrainians aren't using the same ammo we're using, but the Israelis are. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the truth. That's the truth. Anyway, well, um, what else you want to talk about? Well, just, you know, kind of along those lines, when I used to travel and would set up my budget, mm-hmm. I would budget $100 a night for a hotel. When I was yeah. figuring my travel classes, sometimes they come in a little below that. Sometimes you a little more. That now. Yeah, I'm up to 150 a night now yeah. when I figure out my expenses, and yeah. I've had a couple that have been closer to 200. Yeah. Well, airfares have doubled. Mm-hmm. There, there was <clears throat> when I pretty much shut the business down. I was charging 450 for a two day class. Yeah. If I had to like travel to California or Oregon, mm-hmm. I'd have to raise the tuition. Just tra- travel expenses are mm-hmm. crazy now. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I auto bill just every bill that I can to a credit card that gives me points yeah. and I can crash cash those in. I can fly anywhere around trip to Southwest flash for like 11 bucks a flight. Mm-hmm. Um, but if Southwest didn't fly in there direct, it's hard to, it, it, I don't get to use that. Well, um, with air travel being what it is right now, just the yeah. state of it, mm-hmm. if you can't fly direct, you're taking yeah. a risk of even getting there. Yeah. And I've driven to a couple of things here lately that I may have flown to previously because I just want to take the risk. Yeah. It's getting that bad. Yeah. It's getting that bad. And I, I'm probably going to... Uh, probably going to figure for the next while anyway if i can't drive i can't go so you gotta do john hearn <laughs> well uh, for right now until i get done with this graduate program i'm I'm kind of laying low a little yeah. bit um, yeah i get it i get it good yeah. for you congratulations uh, on that by the way i i don't know you. if age 52 i could go back to college well uh I don't know if it was the brightest idea for me to do it, but uh, I'm getting some good things out of the program, uh, Mm -hmm. giving me some different things to think about anyway. And, uh, you know, a couple little tidbits and everything. Uh, One of the reading assignments in this first class that I just completed kind of lit a bell or lit lit a fire under me about some, some things about how to present things um, and look at it differently. And I was talking a couple of weeks ago with Tim Reedy on an episode, and I kind of joked with him that instead of me just telling people, here is the preferred way to do this, 
I show them a couple of inferior ways and then show them the good way. Now, which one worked better for you? Oh, this one. Oh, great. And I'm kind of like psychologically playing the game instead of just going ahead and say, do it this way. And you know, uh, give them yeah. a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think as, as instructors, no, as teachers, mm -hmm. we always look for a better way to present something, mm -hmm. a better way to get the message across because with such a vast array of students right. in one location, getting that light bulb to go off for all of them right. is a real challenge. It's, I'm not so sure it's a skill as much as it's an art. Yeah. Some people have it and some don't. Some people will yeah. never get it. Right. I mean, I've seen, I, I've attended some training by people that I just would look at them and say, you're never going to be good at this. I don't care how long you do it. Right. You're just not going to. But uh, I've also been to some people that are just gifted. Yeah. You're just, they just, when they start presenting, you just, it, it pulls you in. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, other things I'm learning in this program, you know, it's a graduate certificate in workforce and adult education is what it's titled. And the first class, this, this, this past session, like the first six weeks were all about adults and their preferences and learning and all that kind of stuff. And it was painting this whole utopian picture. And I was like, okay, all right, I, I get it in a perfect world. But if you're an organization or an entity, how do you ever get your people to move forward with some of this stuff? And finally, at the end of the class, it started getting into the, the human resource side of it. Mm -hmm. um, the class that started this week, because basically you're taking two classes over a semester, but their first class was the first eight weeks. The second class is the second eight weeks of the semester. This one is dealing with uh, how to plan curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was joking with you in a text message the other day that one of the texts is written by how to teach, you know, something like how to teach adults by D Spalding. I'm like, all right, right. we, we yeah. got a, we got a shot that here. Textbook. And I had, I had actually heard of him, though I had never read any of his stuff. Yeah, and so browsing through some of the the literature that's for this upcoming class, I'm starting to see my outlook starting to get a little better. It's like, okay, we're starting to get into some more realistic stuff here. Well, oh, good, good. There ain't nothing worse than wasting your money and your time. Yeah. Maybe not in that order. Right. Yeah. And, and the cool thing is, is that it's the same professor doing all the classes. And so we started off, well, like the first phase of a project in the first eight weeks. Well, since she's teaching the second eight weeks, she's getting to carry that over. So we're still continuing, you know, with that same project. So I'll come out of this thing with a ready-made tailor product to drop because i'm developing a class that i want to teach good and good. Uh, so so that's there's some benefit to it from that good and um, i'm glad i did it but i'm not necessarily happy sometimes when i'm sitting there in front of the computer trying to bang out a uh an assignment before deadline i hear you i hear you well uh, since things are down right now across the board for you this is probably the time for you to take it on probably have a little more time to do it. I I would not want to be doing that and trying to juggle classes every week. Right. Yeah. I, on the road classes. I could not have done it if I was teaching a lot. And I and I did not schedule some stuff this fall because I knew that I was going to be doing the program. Gotcha. Okay. And Good. Um, Good. and plus I had been trying to limit the training stuff to like one one weekend a month anyway just because of all the other other commitments that I've got. You know, when I started handgun combatives, that was my thought. I'll just do one class a month. Mm -hmm. And then the, it, the proverbial snowball. Right. Then it was two weekends. Then it was three weekends. Mm -hmm. then, 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 And then you get to the point where you don't want to turn people down. Right. Because if you turn this person down, maybe they won't contact you again. Mm -hmm. You don't want to offend people. Right. And then it becomes 30, 35 weekends a year. Right. And then you're burned out. Yeah. So. You know, and I, I guess one thing we can touch on with all that too, that is even if you're driving to classes, that's not cheap either. 
No. Uh, gas has been up. It's starting to trend down now, but with all the stuff in the Middle East, it's going to shoot right back up again. But uh, I taught for Range Master in Arkansas in August mm -hmm. and ended up broken down in Metro Atlanta on the way home. When I No, not Metro Atlanta, downtown Atlanta. Oh, I, took, I camped out in the parking lot to an Atlanta fire, firehouse. Uh, for several hours until a record can get me. I just got my truck back and it's not right yet. I'm just going to go back to the shop for a third time. Uh, God and sake. so I've been having to rent cars to go do stuff and everything. You've got to have a reliable vehicle. And that isn't cheap. Mm -hmm. No, it's 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 a very costly thing. I, I always get a bit amused mm -hmm. by the local, the younger local guys. Uh, to think it's neat to be the national level trainer. Uh, I'll say the same thing to you that Ken Hackathorn said to me, mm -hmm. be careful what you wish for. Yep. You know, when I started out the business, it was just a way for me to pay for me to go to the training that I wanted to go to. And right. it's been basically been dollar in dollar out funding what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it still is that pretty much. Uh, but I also, I had the saying as I wanted to be, be the best double-A manager in baseball. I didn't want to be the national guy, but I wanted that when one of my students showed up in one of your classes or Tom's classes or, or whoever's, they were like, all right, we ain't trained that one. It's going to be okay. And eventually the market forced me into having to travel more. Mm -hmm. uh, local range access became problematic. Uh, I basically got every student locally that I was going to be able to get. I've been through some of my classes numerous times. Uh, well, let me ask, let me ask you this: uh -huh. When you started getting a national reputation, were the local people you work with suddenly jealous, or suddenly standoffish, or suddenly uncooperative? No, no, I didn't have any of that. You were lucky. Yeah. Lucky. The more noteworthy I became the more jealousy became an issue I didn't have any of that like at the ranges and stuff I was using it just became a matter of logistics other people you know getting the That's dates good. and everything That's uh, like good. One, one of the local ranges I was using told me we're going to pencil you in for the third weekend of every month we're going to save that one for you well it just happened that the third weekend of every month like six months straight i had a personal thing or a work thing mm -hmm. and i that was six months i couldn't teach there and so he he sometimes he'd call me he's like i saw you're in you know ohio this month why aren't you here it's like well your range was only available the third weekend of the month and the second weekend was the only weekend i had available and so i booked a class then and went and so so yeah. that's been kind of an issue yeah um, but that's probably the biggest threat to Second Amendment in general, trainers in general, all of it wrapped up in the one. This whole gun thing is access for places to shoot and train. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Range availability and personalities because people are people. Mm -hmm. And that was always the biggest issues I had. I don't know how many times I showed up at like a gun club or a range facility. Mm -hmm. And the first person I met was the gun club president or the guy that owned the range. And they wanted to let me know who was in charge. Mm -hmm. And I had to let them know pretty quick. I didn't care. Yeah. You know, I'll turn right around and you can tell people why I left. Yeah. But, you know, people being people was just, it was odd. I don't miss that stuff. Yeah, I, I was helping Tom with a Tom Givens with a defensive shotgun instructor class in Wisconsin, and we're on the range shooting twelve gauge shotguns, and most of the people in the class also had a pistol and a holster on their belt, and one of the range guys, one of the members, shows up and freaks out over the fact that people have pistols on while shooting shotguns and tried to shut the class down because that's unsafe. I'm like, we're hurling 12 gauges of ammo <laughs> down range with every trigger press, and you're worried about holstered pistols. And uh, Dave Malio was the host for that. You know Dave. 
Yeah. And uh, I, he kind of got in and was able to to uh, to ease that one up a little bit. I had a situation like that at my home club mm-hmm. during the Dayton Legacy Classic. Kill may have may have told you a little bit uh, about this. You know, somebody that wasn't involved that yeah. decided to get involved with something they did they had no idea what they were talking about. Right. But it didn't stop them from sticking their nose in. Mm-hmm. It happens. Mm-hmm. Again, people being people. Right. You know, we, when we were sc- discussing doing this, we were talking about different trends in gear and well, such and the like. Well, you know, let me let me throw some other stuff out at you. Go right ahead. Because since I've slowed this down mm-hmm. and I've taken more opportunity to kind of look at what other people are saying, which is something I didn't have the time to do when I was running the business. But now I do, I have a chance to look and see who's, you know, popular in the industry and what they're saying. And, and it's, I've had some, some observations I think are worth sharing. Okay. The very first one that's popped into my head was for a long time. We used to just debate whether pistol craft was competitive or combative. If you were doing combat, you couldn't be involved in competition and competition would get you killed and back and forth. Mm-hmm. And the instructors that delivered the message thought about it uh-huh. and then came along what is now called performance shooting, which is I'm just teaching you to shoot better. First thing I thought about when I saw that was that's a cop out because now the instructor just teach whatever he wants and he doesn't have to you know pay homage to either side and then i realized maybe not because it dawned on me that we may have this wrong it may not be the instructor delivering whether it's competitive or combative in nature it may come down to how the student receives it okay Um, their attitude about it, how they view the lesson involved may be the determining factor and the instructor has no say in it. Let me give you an example. Sure. In the, in the classes that uh, Rich Nance and I taught in Wyoming and Colorado, we, we ended them with a drill I call gunfight and it's done on a dueling tree. Back in the days when I first started and I was doing the John Hearn thing where I would drive to everything and I would load the back of my truck up with everything I own. Mm -hmm. I'd always take a dueling tree and we would do this drill. And what I liked about gunfight is you could, you could face some of the situations you may actually face in a gunfight without having to get shot at how the drill was run is you would take the six plates and you would each have three on your side. The shooters would stand side by side. They would have 20 rounds, two 10 round magazines. If you had single column magazines, they could have a third to make up the 20 rounds. And you would always get that. Well, that's not fair. I'll have to reload twice. You chose what you're carrying. I didn't pick your gun for you. Right. You know, I didn't pick your gun. But that gives you insight on how this is viewed already. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen is they would stand side by side. And on the command, they would try to shoot the plate on their side to their opponent's side. Mm -hmm. When they both were out of ammunition, the guy with the most plates on his side was the loser. But think about this. If you've got to stop and do a reload, he's still shooting at you. Yeah. He's still knocking your plates over. You have a stoppage clearance. He's still shooting at you by knocking your Mm -hmm. plates over. If you draw and miss the first round, you're behind. If you're missing your plates, you're behind. And it shows you how far you can get behind by missing. Instead of ensuring a good hit, by spraying a bunch of bullets, it costs you more time than if you would just hit in the first place. Yeah. Well, we did these drills and it was always interesting how they viewed it. One of the things that always threw me off, you would have a guy that would get all the plates over on his opponent's side 
then he would stand there and the plates would come back over and they wouldn't shoot. And you would ask him, what are you, what are you doing? Why are you shoot? Oh, well, you know, it's easier to shoot three or four plates in a row. And it's a little more fun. It looks cooler to do that. But then they would miss and they would knock the three or four plates over mm -hmm. and they would end up losing. And you would say, how'd that work out for you? And they would say, well, really, we should be doing this the best two out of three. Or they would try to put some competitive scoring on it. If the plate didn't go all the way over, I considered that a stopping power failure. Mm -hmm. They would say, no, we should get credit for that. But then there was always the final. Well, that's not fair. So it, I've been seeing this for the last couple of years, but it dawned on me that it's not what we're teaching. It's how they're receiving it. Yeah. And most of these people aren't receiving it like this is a really serious situation I could face. Mm -hmm. They're receiving this like something that's competitive in nature or is something that's just a fun weekend out. Mm -hmm. So we could probably be delivering the most slapstick lessons out there. But as long as they're enjoying it, okay. Yep. Yep. Lee, that's a sad state of affairs. Yeah, one thing that I have found in shotgun classes is there's a direct correlation with student satisfaction and the number of times you run Rolling Thunder. Because the rest of the class can go horribly. But if you let them shoot Rolling Thunder enough, mm -hmm. then they, oh, this was a great class. And what does Rolling Thunder mean? It's, it's just an exercise in keeping the shotgun loaded. It's got no realism to it whatsoever. And how many times do you reload in a shotgun fight? <laughs> Tom, be Gibbons told me, Tom Gibbons has told me he's only found one that right. involved three rounds, and that was because the guy glanced on the shoulder on his first shot. Right. And, and you know, you to, to me, running a shotgun is get it. Whoever gets it up first gets it into action and gets the first center mass hits, probably won the gunfight. And it's over. Yeah, it's, it's over. probably over. All yeah. the all the clearance stoppages and mortaring the gun on the mm -hmm. ground and speed loading yeah. it. Probably ought to be doing more ready up stuff in a shotgun right. class. Yeah. But and I, I tell, go ahead. That's a perfect example, Lee, of exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I tell students that the reason we're doing all the manipulations in shotgun class is so that they learn how to run their gun and no matter what circumstances that they're going to find the gun. But it's all about getting it up and getting that first effective hit. And I was teaching a class for, for the agency. And I told them as we were running Rolling Thunder, and I told them what I told you now. I said, you know what I found in these classes is that everything else can go poorly. But if you run Rolling Thunder enough, people will enjoy it. And one of the guys raised his hand and said, can we shoot it again? <laughs> sure, go ahead. And they're over laughing and carrying on and whatever. It's like, well, I don't know if they can remember anything else from the class, but they have fun shooting Rolling Thunder. And it doesn't mean anything. Hmm. I, uh, you know, I, I, observations like that. Yeah. Just, it makes me shake my head because I, I would like to think that the last 40 some years I didn't waste. Right. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I if, yeah. if all people want to do is have a good time. Yeah. Then the perfect pistol craft class would be just one drill after the next mm -hmm. where they can compete against each other yep. and, and hand out door prizes. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 for some reason uh, I should, by this point in my career, well, my career's over by this point in my life, I should not be surprised by this, but by the same token, I I'm disappointed. Yeah. I'm disappointed in it. Yeah, I attended Eric Gelhaus's pistol mounted optic instructor class in June, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And Brian Eastridge was also in the class, and Brian wrote a review. And he, in, his, in his review, he said something like there was no range Pokemon 
talking about the little trinkets and stuff given out. Right. And that incensed some people. What so, do you mean? And just got all upset. It's like it was all about how to run the optic, how to teach the optic, all this kind of stuff. And just, you know, we weren't competing for door prizes. And yeah. there's another observation right. right there. As you well know, I have tried to make finding the dot as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. To explain it as simple as possible and teach people to do it as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. but they don't accept it. Right. They want it to be something very special, mm -hmm. very complicated. That's in requirement of days of training yep. when it's really not. I mean, I'll see people put an optic on the top of their gun. That's, you know, this big around yeah. well, because it's easier to find. No, it's not. Yeah. If you could point your gun and find the front sighter in your pistol, you can point your gun and find your dot. I use that little Holosun SCS. Mm -hmm. It's no wider than my Glock slide. I have no problem finding it. Yeah. I use the method I have taught you and many other people. Mm -hmm. If you have the proprioception to point the muzzle, you can find the dot. And there's the problem, Lee. Yeah. Everybody wants to guide the optic and nobody wants to point the muzzle. Yeah. All the sight does, doesn't matter what type of sight it is. Mm -hmm. All the sight does is tell you where the muzzle is pointed. Yeah. So use the proprioception to point the muzzle yeah. and the dot will be there. And if it's not, it's just off to the side a little bit. You don't want to use a really aggressive movement because you'll just exchange one problem for another. Yep. So if you just tighten your hands, I had one instructor quote me as all Spalding does is tighten his wrists. Yep. <laughs> Dude, your wrists should already be tightened when you get it up yeah. in front of your eyes, but yeah. all you got to do is just tighten your hands because that's the minimal yeah. amount of motion that I could think of that would, wait for it, huh. the minimal amount of motion that would be applied to your muzzle, mm -hmm. not to your optic. Yep. It works. It's yep. worked by everybody. Eric Gelhaus, who I have the greatest respect for, is, is doing the red dot classes mm -hmm. up at Gunsight. When the class ended, he looked at me and went, Yep. I mean, it's it's not a lot of a lot of yeah. movement to get that dot to move into the screen. Right. And everybody yeah. everybody remembers me telling them to tighten their hands, but mm -hmm. nobody ever seems to remember you got to point the muzzle. Right. Oh well, Dave, you've got oh. really really dark. If you got a light, you can turn on in there. I got one right here. Tell me if All it's right. too much. All right. That'll work. You'd, you'd disappear if we could hear your voice coming. <laughs> you <would> just <laughs> Well, the sun was bright when uh, yeah. when we started, so. Yeah, in, in a similar vein to that, I use a, I guess you can say a variation of your technique is what I mm -hmm. finally settled on for, for dropping the dot in where I wanted it. And one of our guys who's always struggled to qualify, but he has a vision issue, a legit physical vision issue. Sure. Um and dealing with eye focus and stuff. I uh, decided to make the transition to a dot and he's gone to a couple of other classes and everything from, from some, from area guys. And I was down at the range with him and I was like, told him drive the gun out to the target and then just wherever it lands, hold it right there. And he drove the gun out. I said, is the dot in the optic on the target? He's like, no. I said, all right, Watch this. And I reached up and I grabbed the, the muzzle of the gun and I eased the muzzle down oh. so that it would come in. I said, all right, did that drop the dot in? And I had him do, you know, go out, drop it out again. All right, it's not there right now. You move the muzzle downward. Everything had to drop in. It's like, yeah, I said, okay, how about this? Now when your hands come together, go ahead and do that movement and then drive the gun to I the see. target. Yeah. Is yeah. the dot there? Yeah. 
and he just he just didn't want to accept that that was all it took. To, yeah. <laughs> you know, we got to have this special. Finding the dot is easy. Yeah. People just won't let it. Yeah. They, they won't let it be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you can just get it out of their head that they're not trying to direct the optic, that right. they're pointing the muzzle, yeah. it's almost like, wow, it shows up. Yeah. And it's they're they're not they're not shifting yeah. the dot. They're moving the muzzle. You're yep. you're forget the forget the dot. Right. Point the muzzle, and you'll yeah. and it, it's it's really not that hard. It's not hard at all. But yeah. another observation: people yeah. want to believe it's hard. Yep. They think it requires special training and technique, and it doesn't. Right. I, I've got some real problems with some of the things I've seen taught, where and. and a lot of people are listening to this. They won't see it. But the idea that you bring the gun up and then drop it down. Yeah. Well, that totally defies what you and I know is the single most important thing you can do in a gunfight. <laughs> Getting the gun between you and the bad guy in a usable <laughs> form. Gun. Who wants the gun here? No, it's it's right. got to go. It's got to go straight to the target. Yep. In your, your competition, do whatever you want. Yeah. Been in a gunfight, you got to get the muzzle again, the muzzle yeah. between you and the threat as soon as possible. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of stuff works great on a square range and broad daylight, standing on your hind legs at stationary cardboard or steel targets. Mm -hmm. If you can't do it down on one knee, crouched over to the side with trying to hide behind a tire and a wheel well. Going up underneath the fender of a car, it's just not working. That's right. Or hunched up fetal position behind a tire. Yeah. Or or supine because your gunfight started with a body check. Right. And, and that people, may, go ahead. That that may that may be a perfect example of the difference between competition and combat. You know, when I started fooling with the dots. And I was, I said, I'm going to go back and go through something that equates to every bit of other training I have done. I'm going to go do something force on force with a dot. I'm going to do some night fire with a dot. I'm going to do all this other stuff before I carry one into the field. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, you've, you've got all this training and you've been to so many dot instructor courses. You want to, I still hadn't done at the time, still hadn't done a force on force with it. I still hadn't done a low light with it. I still hadn't done some other stuff. And when I got to got to doing some of those other things, I found some serious holes. Yeah. And I had to go back and fix them. Well, and that brings us to another observation. Sure. The dot's not essential. Right. It can be useful, mm -hmm. but it's not essential. Right. The dot is useful for Dave Spaulding. Mm -hmm. because of my eyesight where i am at my age it has been a real asset to me however i would not want to be the training supervisor who suddenly has dots thrust on their multi-hundred or maybe thousands of person agency mm -hmm. they're going to get a day or so to show them how to use it and then their officers are going to go to the range two, three, four times a year and try to use it mm -hmm. and make them good with it. Yep. I wouldn't want to be that guy. Uh, the, the dot can be useful. It can be an asset. Oh, yeah. If you can, if you can commit yourself to it. But there's too many people, especially cops, that are putting it on their gun because it looks cool mm -hmm. or it's the latest technology. Yeah. that is never going to commit to it. Yep. And I suspect it may, I'm going to be careful about how I say this because I don't want to offend every dot equipped gun out there. It may potentially be more hindrance than help. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know you pointed out to me that your biggest concern with the optics was zero shift. And I have experienced Unexpected that. Unexpected shift of zero, yes. I have mechanical, experienced that. Mechanical shift of zero, yeah. Yeah. I have experienced that personally with one to the point that I was miss, missing headshots at seven yards. Not missing the X on the B8 and out in the 10 ring. Missing a headshot at seven yards. Oh, yeah. And um, 
I, I was doing a demo for for a student and I missed the shot. And I thought, well, I got to own that one. Let me do it again. And I missed the shot. I'm like, hold on just a second. Like, I need to check something. Mm-hmm. And I shot for a group on a different target. It's like, wow. That's also, I put that gun down, picked up another gun and nailed it. Like, yeah, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And it can shift right. like this. Right. I mean, uh, from target to target, it can. Sure. Uh, Tom did a five day instructor class last week and had four people with optics have the optics go down. Uh, I saw a post from someone here local that is at what Ed Monk's class this weekend and they lost the optic on their guy. Now that's a mounting issue, but I continue to see that kind of stuff happen. And, and we can, and we can take it away just from the dot. So we're not just making dot people mad extended magazines on pistols because it looks cool. You know, LAPD just issued this big thing, no more extended magazines on, on pistols and everything. I have repeatedly seen people have problems with those. Long run. If they're out there, if they're actually using their gun, when it's when I say extended magazine, folks, I'm talking about one that has a base plate that you take the factory base plate off and you slide this other base plate on that's, that adds three or four rounds to the gun. I have repeatedly seen problems yeah. with that. You see, the, you see the entire assembly come off the bottom of it and everything mm-hmm. falls out. Um, I've seen that a lot myself. Yeah, They put this cool looking stuff on it and they're doing something and all of a sudden you hear this twang yep. and their floor plate and their magazine or their boot, whatever comes off, everything falls out the bottom. Right. And you just look at them and say, you know, what if that had been a gunfight? Yeah, and it's... If you're selecting stuff because it looks cool, you're selecting it for the wrong reason. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, you see that more than I, I would like to say. That's yeah. another one of my observations. Right. Tactical really exists. Mm-hmm. It, it really does. People put stuff. Um, well, I had a uh, uh, one of my instructors that I certified, mm-hmm. like you, <laughs> reached out to me and was doing a thing with red dot optics. And he finally had one of his guys say, yeah, but the thing just looks so cool on my gun. Yep. Uh, well, I'm glad for you, but that's the wrong reason. Yeah. And I guess, you know, to kind of continue with my theme of yelling at clouds here, bolt on compensators. Why are you going to put something on your fighting gun that makes your gun less reliable? Well, I think it's to control the awesome recoil of the nine millimeter <laughs> pistol. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is the chosen caliber of yeah. how fast can I make my splits? Right. You, you never see anybody do that with a 45 or a 44 right. special or something like that. They always do it with a nine millimeter because you can shoot it fast. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you want to put a compensator on your gun, I mean, I guess I don't care, right. but uh, it, I don't see a, I, I don't see a, a point to it other than I, I yeah, it looks neat. I, yeah. I I've, you know, I, I had a 44 Magnum that I had magnaported once and, and I thought that was a pretty handy thing to do right. other than the flame that shot out of it when the, the light <laughs> went low. But, um, yeah. but I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a nuts and bolts guy. Yeah. I like the simplest, most straightforward, sleek, lightweight, easy to carry holsters and guns and mm-hmm. all of that stuff. And that, that attitude has never failed me. Yeah. What has failed me is when I start adding stuff on and I'm just as bad as anybody else. When I was younger, I tried all that different stuff and very seldom did it work. Yep. You know, and that may be one of the, one of the issues why the industry is down right now. Let's just say it's boredom. Might be. There's just, you know, every now and then, 
you'll see something go out of vogue and then a few years later it pops up and it gets big you know a couple of years ago shotguns became the big thing again where they had kind of faded out uh for a while and everybody's like, oh we got to take a shotgun class now or we we got to take this other thing there's not a whole lot of game-changing innovation that's coming coming down the pike right now and folks there's a reason fn quit producing the high power and then all of a sudden springfield comes out with one and like three or four other companies pop up with them again gotta and, have one yeah we gotta have this and it's like what and oh you see all the excitement on the gun forms right now when someone finds a cache of third generation smiths I carried a third generation Smith for seven years because that's what my uh, agency gave me. Ain't no way in the world I'm doing it voluntarily. I don't want, I don't want to go back to a safety decock lever. No, uh, no. Yeah. No. I mean, I had a 6906 and, and I did like the gun, uh, but I, I don't want to do it again. You know, I've got the two third generation Smiths that I carried on duty because I was able to get them as they went out of service. Mm-hmm. And I cleaned them what will be the last time they ever get cleaned for as long as I own them because I'm never going to shoot them again. No. Unless, you know, we're really, really in dire straits and not, I'm down to the last few 40 caliber rounds that I've got stashed away somewhere because the that thing was so hard to clean. The third generation Smith had an interesting trigger in the fact that the very first double action trigger may have been the worst ever, but the subsequent single action triggers were great. Right. Oh, man, it was fantastic. I don't know, I don't know how they did that. Yeah. But you went from just absolutely awful to really good. So, you know. Yeah. And then you had to down and up. And yeah. You remember the 1076? Uh, they tried to simulate yeah. the SIG type trigger yeah. and they had those little teeth oh, and they would break off and fall. Oh, what a terrible mm -hmm. idea. What yeah. a terrible idea. I went to an armorer school on the 4006 or well, on the third gen Smiths not long before we took them out of service in favor of Glock. And it was a three day armorer school and we had to buy a $150 toolkit in addition to the tuition. And because I wanted my own tools, I bought my own toolkit instead of the mm -hmm. agency buying it. And then as we were looking at what we were going to go to, Glock gave me a free slot in their one day armor course. And they Which gave me that half a day. Yeah. Yeah. And they gave me the one tool, which is a, th a th what a three thirty second punch. punch. Yeah. yeah. That you needed to take that gun completely apart. And I was sold. I was did absolutely you, sold. Did you by chance get to take Smith & Wesson's Revolver Armor School? No, I didn't get to do that. See, I went to I went to the Smith & Wesson Academy and took Revolver and Pistol. Mm -hmm. And they gave, in the Revolver, you got this big hunk of lead they called a Babbitt. Yeah. And that's what you smack the cylinder and crane with to line it up. They used to tell you. Don't let anybody watch you work on their gun because they're not going to like it. <laughs> and, you know, that's that's one of the, the striker fired polymer frame guns have been so simple and people have gotten so accustomed to that that they got bored with it. And all of a sudden there's 2011s come out and, oh, wow, it's all this exciting. You get this great trigger <coughs> press and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's going to be great right until you need to fix that thing. Is is a 2011, and I have to admit, I'm speaking out of my ignorance, mm -hmm. is a 2011 anything other than a 1911 with a double stack magazine? Not from my experience, no. I'm sure there may be some intricacy thing that when, I'm not when getting. I've, when I've taken them apart and looked at them, other than, you know, they got a wider mm -hmm. trigger bar that goes around the magazine or whatever. Um they look identical, but I, yeah. I wasn't sure if there was something yeah. I wasn't seeing. That's my understanding of the platform is that it's just a wide body 1911 or, you know, the, or double stack 1911. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, there's I, mean, some other... I like them. I got nothing against them, but mm -hmm. they're, they're really expensive. 
you know, I've had a couple of students show up with staccatos in classes, and I was like, you mind if I take a take a run with that? And I'll shoot it for a couple of rounds, and I hand it back to them. That's a nice gun. They're like, you going to get one? No. It's a very nice gun, but it's really expensive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, that one gun, because I do everything in duplicate, I do a training you know, facsimile of my actual carry sure, gun. Sure. Everything. Sure. It's like I've got my carry Glock, my training Glock, three bags worth of magazines and everything, and I still haven't haven't come close to what that one gun cost. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's they're expensive. Yeah. And my and my son in law, Darren. Did you ever meet him? I never met Darren. Yeah. He uh he has an affinity for high end nineteen elevens. Mm-hmm. I, he hasn't gotten a staccato yet, but I would be a bit surprised that he does. Yeah. He's got a really good job, so he can afford it. But you know, uh, <laughs> but I, he's got some guns that I, I even today, I don't think I can afford. Yeah, and it's just obviously you want the best tool that's available to you if you have to defend your life with it, mm -hmm. and. And like I, I get that whole part of the argument. But at the same time, until you can prove to me that there is infinitely more production coming out of that gun, is it you're gonna have to prove to me that I can shoot it at a certain percentage level higher than what I can get out of my four hundred dollar Glock. And Glock's my generic for striker fire or whatever. You know, you're going to have to prove to me that, there, that there's that much more performance out of it before I drop that much more money on it. Well, you've attended every class, every class I ever offered. Mm -hmm. And I always shot my Glock 19. You've shot mm -hmm. my Glock 19. Mm -hmm. I never had any trouble holding my own against anybody's gun in those classes. Right. So there may be just, wait a minute, there may be something to do with the operator. Yeah involved in that right okay I, I don't begrudge anybody that can afford and wants yeah. a high-end gun yeah. i i personally don't i don't want to say this to be offensive because i'm not trying to be but i dave spalding doesn't see a reason to do it right. i don't see a reason to spend the money right. if i if i did i i'm not opposed to it mm -hmm. but i i don't see the reason to do it you know, the, it goes back to the performance gain. If there's enough performance gain, all right. And, you know, two more points on my score on a B8 target over a 30 round course. That's to me, that's mm -hmm. not performance gains. I, I've been a Glock 19 guy for since I've had a Glock 19. <laughs> so it's, I have tried to leave the Glock couple of times or more than more than twice you know because something new come in i'm bored and i'll give it a try and i'll you're, always you're find myself right back anymore. what's that you're not using that cz anymore i've still got the cz's yeah. uh, now i bought those when i started playing with the optic because that's what i could get my hands on that was readily an optic ready model uh because that was all during all the pandemic stuff and i couldn't get uh glocks at the time ready for the optics uh I ran into some issues with the mounting plates. Oh, okay. And but you were really enthusiastic about that compact P10. I love it. I actually yeah. can ring a little bit more performance out of it, a little bit more than I can ring out of out of a, a Glock 19. As so if all things were being equal, if I could get a direct mounted CZ P10C the way I want to run it with, you know, the grip tape up, I don't know, that kind of stuff compared to. Right, uh, right. I see a little bit of a gain. Now, you start stripping those guns down, and there's a, there's a lot more intricate on the inside of that CZ mm -hmm. than it is sure, on Glock sure. 19, and I know how to keep Glock 19 running. I don't know how to keep that CZ running if something goes wrong with it. Well, you know, the Glock 19, it's got a four inch barrel. It's mm -hmm. big enough. It's small enough. It's trim yeah. enough. You know, people always say, well, you know, you always get the grip reduced. Yeah. I do. I always get the grip reduced. 
but the gun I'm using right now, that's the only thing I've had done to it. Yeah. I've had a 1911 style grip put on it, but all the rest of it's pretty much factory yeah. other than the whole of sun optic that's on it. And I'm perfectly content. It works just fine. I can hit a three by five card at 25 yards. Yeah. I don't know what, what more I need to do. Yeah. Both of my P10Cs other than like the optic plate and the optic on them are, are and the sights are, are factory. I've got a Glock 45 from the factory with an optic, you know, one of those sets that they sell sure. for everything for the agencies, a gen five Glock 40. That is exactly as it came out of the box. Right. Although I did, I did take the optic off, wipe it down with, with, uh, you know, good, I degreased everything and I remounted it cause I, I wanted sure. to make sure. sure, but everything on that gun is as it came from the factory. And that, that's a good running gun right there. Mm -hmm. uh, I prefer the shorter grip frame, grip length of the 19, uh, but that's probably my best performing out of the box gun right now. Well, you know, the 19, it ends right here mm -hmm. at the bottom of my hand. Yeah. So I see no reason to have a longer grip. Right. I mean, uh, it, it would just be excess. Mm -hmm. So if I had bigger hands, maybe what you're talking yeah. about would make sense to me, but it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. To me, to me, it's harder to conceal. Well, sure. And, uh, and yeah. I want, I want to be able to carry the same gun and do on duty that I'm carrying off duty. Sure, uh, don't hurt. Sure, uh, don't hurt. Uh, I, I did notice that uh, with the Gen Five frame on that 45, that when I would go to do a slide lock reload, it was a little more difficult for me to get to the magazine release. Then say, because I've got a 19 with the same grip reduction you used to have done with, uh, what was the company up there in Ohio? Bowie Tactical, or uh, uh, Templar. Templar. I've got one of those. Mm -hmm. And then I've got, uh, well, I've got just a factory stock Gen 3 19 that I carry every day. But mm -hmm. then the CZs are perfect. Man, that they are actually perfect to get to the to the button. Well, with the Gen 5 45, I was having a little bit of issue getting to the slide, to the, excuse me, the mag release. And I thought, oh, wow, this, because I was shooting a test in a class where there was bragging rights and scores on the line. And I'm like, oh, wow, I can't do the reload as smooth as I do it and everything. You know what? Slide lock reloads in the field are such a low percentage thing. Why am I worried about my score on this one drill on this test? Well, just the, more round, the more rounds you have in the gun, the less likely they are. Right. That's that's true, but I mean, let's face it: in a gunfight, yeah. the only reload you'll probably ever do is a slide lock reload, mm -hmm. because people shoot the guns empty. Yeah, but you know something? This is another set of observations. Mm -hmm. What we've just been talking about: what's important to us and why. Right. But you know what? At least we give it thought. Mm -hmm. We don't just say, "Oh, this is the latest trend," or "That gun looks cool." Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to get it because everybody else has it. You know, we think about it. Mm -hmm. Can we reach the, the magazine release button? Can you reach the side stop? Uh, can you mount the optic the way you want? Those are truly important things. Whether the gun is the end thing or I can attach a compensator to it mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be they're not important they're they're not to me right. um and you know maybe maybe it would be nice to well no it would be nice to see more of that yeah then just follow the leader yeah i was teaching an agency class this past week and we spent a good bit of time on slide lock reload Oh, uh, give their reps on it, I guess. Let's say, and I told them, I said, "Look, the only reason we're doing that is you have one of these on the clock in the qualification course you're going to shoot at the end of the day." And the only reason I've got that in the course is because I've got to to make a meet a state mandate. Mm -hmm. And I see people continually struggle with this. I said, "Folks, don't go away from here today thinking that because we spent so many reps on this that it's that important." This is actually the least important of everything you're going to do in this class. 
and in the qual course you're going to shoot later. But you pay such a penalty on the score if you don't do this. Well, and I'm having to train you to something because of your score on a test, not because it's something you're going to do. And, and let's even talk about something less important. Right. Should I drop the slide with my shooting hand <laughs> thumb, yeah. my support hand thumb, or yeah. should I rack the slide? Yep. Who cares? Right. Get it done. Do it mm -hmm. the same way every time. Yep. Get it done and drive on. Yeah. yeah. And I can make arguments for all three of those. I can too. Uh, I can too. I tell people, as long as you do it the same way every time, don't worry about it. Yep. I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I use my shooting hand thumb. Mm -hmm. I do it without conscious thought. Yep. When I have a gun that won't let me do it, then I notice. Yeah. And I'll go to the offhand thumb. But I certainly have no problem with racking the slide. Whether you overhand it or inboard it, who right. cares? Right. It's it, it just get it done. Yep. Get it done. It, if I were starting all over, knowing everything that I know now, uh, I would train myself to do it with the support hand thumb. Mm -hmm. But I've got too many repetitions of doing that it with a strong the hand thumb. That makes the most sense. Yeah. And yeah. it crosses over if you're having a, if you're shooting an AR platter rifle. You got the exactly, same combination of technique. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That that makes the most most sense. And um, I don't know how many strong hand thumb slide lock reloads I have performed in my shooting career. I can tell you that four times I have sent the slide forward without the magazine being seated. Yes. To miss the round. The fact that I can tell you that it's four it means all four of them stand out in my mind. I I feel the same. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Every once in a while, you get that timing wrong. Yep. It happens. It happens. Yeah, I, I agree with you. If people would ask me what I think is the best way, it's the offhand. Yeah. Because it works with works with all guns. Yep. And you know, here's the thing. It's whatever you learn first is going to be the strongest thing that's in your brain. If because you were, start a over, yeah. you were a blank slate, yep. right? Yeah. If, if I were starting over again now, I would never do anything but an in in excuse me inbound uh, manipulation of the slide. Excuse me, inboard manipulation of the slide, board like manipulation. You teach, you teach yeah. slide because I know it's superior. I've tested it and they're all kind of, and I know it's superior. But in my mind, if I'm not consciously thinking about it, I go right back to overhand. Well, I mean, uh, biomechanically and speed, yeah. even speed and speed's yeah. not a big important thing to me. Right. It it's proven. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I can say about the inboard manipulation versus yeah. the overhand, it gave me one of my most memorable events in that class down in Louisiana with John Hearn. Yep. <laughs> Watching him slapping his gun and trying to get that to work. That was yes. hilarious. I had that video and it, it shows up on his phone at the most inopportune <laughs> times for him. And uh, I love just like in the middle of the night, sending it to him. So he wakes up and sees it in the morning as the first thing he sees. And, uh, it, uh, it, it was funny. It was yeah. funny. It's, yeah. it's one of two videos that I have of him just like galactically screwing up in classes. It's just like I just rotate whichever ones I send to him. Well, he even told me afterwards, he said, my brain went blank. I said, yeah. <laughs> I, I love to point out to him that uh, as well, that while he did earn a belt buckle in that class, I earned two. You earned two. Yeah. And uh, so we, we have that conversation every now and then. Like I'll take, I've got a picture of both buckles sitting beside him and I'll send that to him. It's like, so how many of these do you have again? Yeah. Matter of fact, I'm probably going to do that tonight when I, when we get off. Well, you, you were the only one in that class that got the two by two, weren't you? Yes. Was yeah. that the only time you ever got the two by two? Yes. And I think I hold, Numbers one and and two of being the best time that didn't get it as well. Yeah, yeah. It's people don't realize it's a hard. It's 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 not a difficult skill drill. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult mental drill. Yep. Because you did it one time, 
and you attempted at least six? Uh, I think four in class. In class? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because you took you took everything but reduced light. Yeah, well, we didn't do it in the uh, optic class. That's right, because it was a one day class. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. Um, when you came here for the very first class we ever did together, I didn't get the second shot on the, on mm -hmm. the, I was well under the time, but the second shot was not on the post-it note or but, on the three by five. But you cleaned the three round fade back. I did do that. One time there, out of many times I've done, I've done it one were, time. There were far more people that accomplished yeah. the two by two than cleaned the three round fade back. And. And let's say in Michigan, I did it in like 201. Mm -hmm. And I've got another one. I did it in South Carolina. I think I did it in 204. Mm -hmm. And I think you said Steve Fisher had like a 202 or 202. 2.04. Yeah. 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 And um, I think in Michigan, I was like a 2.02 .02 or something like that. You, you, you might have been. You might have been. Yeah. There, were, there were a few people that were just yeah. a few hundreds. Right. But the cutoff was 2.00. Yep. You know, I'll say this about that drill and the three round fade back. Those are two high concentration drills that you have to be able to repeat your skill over and over and over again with no room for error whatsoever. Okay. You can do this magnificent sub second draw. Can you put a same shot, you know, put a subsequent shot in that same area again? Mm -hmm. Well, you that see, to you, me, said, you said the operative word, they were, they were about concentration. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a 20 foot or seven yard fast draw and hit on an eight inch circle. Right. That doesn't require concentration. No. just requires, requires motor function. Yep. But to focus on doing something mm -hmm. that is difficult. Well, for the vast majority of people. Yeah. And I, and in every class you heard me, I would always ask, do you guys know what three round fadebacks about? And you'd get all these blank faces <laughs> and you'd say, it's about your ability to focus, to concentrate. And then they, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Concentrate and deliver under pressure. Yeah. And yeah. those are some things you're probably going to have to do if you're fighting for your life. Well, isn't concentration under pressure more difficult than concentration in general? Mm -hmm. Because everybody talks about stress, stress. It's not stress, it's duress. Right. When you're in combat, it's a level of pressure that you've probably never, ever experienced before. Yep. And being able to focus under that level of pressure. Mm -hmm. that's probably the difference between the winner and the loser. Yeah, and being able to concentrate under duress and perform, you know, there are a lot of ambiguous situations out there or they start off ambiguous or they turn ambiguous. Having to make that decision of whether or not I do this life altering thing of pressing this trigger, mm -hmm. that's not a physical skill. That's a mental skill. It is. It is. I mean, the ability to go into a gunfight situation knowing you're going to pull the trigger before you go. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to diminish it, but that's an advantage. Yeah. Going into the situation and not knowing what's going to unfold and whether or not you are going to be permitted by law to shoot, that adds a lot of duress yep. that many people don't overcome. Yeah. They actually lose because of it. Uh, in, in my legalities presentation, I have a slide that shows it's a picture taken inside of one of the aircraft that's about to fly over the English Channel for paratroopers to jump out of it on D-Day. 
And then another one is like a huge chaotic fight going on in what appears to be a Walmart parking lot. Okay, one of those situations is highly stressful. There's a high probability of death. But there's no ambiguity about it. Mm-hmm. When you jump out of that plane, everybody that's not dressed like you, kill them. Mm-hmm. Okay, and this other one, in this melee in this parking lot, who's the good guys and who are the bad guys? So I, did I ever tell you about when I went to Crucible and I went through their shoot house? I'm not certain. Tell it again, even if you have. Well, you know, you and I, when we do a shoot house drill, mm-hmm. it's pretty much the same format. You work your way through very slowly. You slice the pie or you may lean out around a corner a little bit. Yeah. You identify the threat. You verbalize it. You shoot if necessary, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know the rules of engagement. When I went down to Crucible, and of course, you know, Crucible specialized in training people who weren't supposed to be where they were. Yeah. So a whole different kind of place for a law enforcement officer. Mm-hmm. I went down there and Kelly McCann took me into their shoot house. And we didn't start at the door. We went into the middle of it and stopped. And he said, okay, here's your scenario. You're an intelligence officer. You're meeting with an asset in a hotel in an African nation when a coup d'etat breaks out. You have to leave. <laughs> and he walks out. I'm like, what? This isn't the normal instructions I get. Yep. Well, very quickly, it dawned on me what the rules of engagement were. Everybody died. Everybody you encountered, you shot. There was no CNN. There, there was, I mean, you had no idea who they were. So as you went out, you engaged everybody, you shot everybody, and then you left. And I got out and his co-instructor, Phil Motzer, met me and he goes, so what do you think? And I stopped and I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, it was different, but it was easier. It was much easier. It was much faster, but for someone who is judicious by nature Mm -hmm. and follows the rules of the use of force, it was a bit disconcerting. Yeah. But there are people out there who are, in my opinion, doing God's work that work under those rules of engagement. Yeah. And it's... As you have pointed out and numerous times in your classes, we put on the white hat and we play by the rules. The people we may be up against aren't under the same set of restrictions. No, no. We're not allowed to cheat. And let's face it, in a fight, if you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough to win. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I truly believe having been both a police trainer Mm -hmm. And I've trained some military folks, some intelligence folks, but for the most part, law enforcement, armed citizen, Mm -hmm. armed citizens got it easier when it, when it comes to confrontations of the, of the three groups, military, law enforcement, armed citizens, law enforcement has it the hardest. Yeah. Uh, We got the most rules. Yeah. The most restrictions. Most scrutiny. Uh, Um, we have to at times press the contact with the bad guy where if I was a private citizen, I wouldn't. I would not. I wouldn't be going out there. I and, would not. Uh, and I would probably end up being justified. Yeah. Whereas as a law enforcement officer, because of scrutiny, I may yeah. not. Yeah. I, I had a discussion with a family member that had some people show up on their property and was concerned about it. And wanted to get an AR-15 and start doing this stuff. And I was like, why? And we kept having the discussions like you live in a house that has brick walls on the exterior. The only way to approach your bedroom is to come down a narrow hallway. 
if they show up on your property again, you call the people that you pay to deal with those problems for you. And you go into your bedroom and you get that 12 gauge shotgun and you get behind the bed with the muzzle boy in it towards the door and you stay there. <laughs> yeah, while somebody else deals with that problem. If they're outside of your house, they are not your problem to deal with. No, they are not. It's the simplest solution. Yep. And you know, why people, why people that don't have children mm -hmm. feel like they want to venture out and clear their house. Yep. I have no idea as a person who has done many, many both building searches and room mm -hmm. clearings. I have actually been involved in four hostage rescues where we recovered hostages. Wow. Somebody that has done that, somebody that has done that, mm -hmm. I will tell you, there's nothing exciting about doing that. Yeah. And as a lone individual, it is more likely you will lose than win. Yep. So unless you've got children you've got to get to, Mm -hmm. don't do it barricade your door get behind the bed yeah or climb out the window yep. thankfully i have not had to be involved in anything like that with the hostage rescue i did one night with one other officer and his trainee actually my trainee and with one other officer had to clear a nine floor college dormitory in the middle of the night that was closed down for renovation and an alarm went off and it, they thought they had someone inside the building and found an open door to get in there. And my Lieutenant was like, oh, you got to go check every single possible place that person could be. And I was exhausted. Seven and floors. Then, nine. Nine. You were exhausted by floor three. Yeah. Yeah, it was exhausting. And did you notice your focus starting to drift on you as you fatigued? Yeah, yeah. that's tough. That's really tough. And the the other guy who had some experience and I, we had kind of worked out a plan that as we would get to each door, one of us would hit the doorknob and the yeah. other one was responsible for the clearing. And for some reason, about four, six or seven, I went to hit the doorknob and he kicked it or something, whatever. And I ended up stepping in front of him accidentally. And I turned around, his guns out pointed at me. Oops. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We, we had a chat after that. Just all it took was one little, well, see, one little middle lapse. On those entry type situations, a little mistiming can result in that. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize it. Yeah. Even clearing a two-story house is enough to mentally exhaust you. Mm -hmm. uh, good Lord, a cubicle farm mm -hmm. and all the places that someone could be hidden in, in one of those. And it's amazing where people can fit themselves. Mm -hmm. Yep. If they're, if they're motivated enough, they can cram themselves in some pretty small areas. Oh yeah. We, we secured a, a single story ranch style house for several hours as someone prepared a warrant, went and found a judge, got it signed, brought it to the scene. Cause you know, on TV, they make it, it's like you just called somebody on the phone and yeah, we'll give you authorization. No folks, there's, there's a lot more to it than that. So we had this house secured as the whole warrant process was, was taking place. So a couple of hours by the time the warrant was finally there, ready for us to go execute it. And we start, we did a cursory clearing of the house, everything, and we start to go doing our detailed search. And 30 minutes, 45 minutes into this detailed search, we found somebody hiding in a dirty clothes hamper in a closet. And if they're motivated enough. Yep. If they're motivated enough. Yep. Yeah. You know, everybody talks about, well, bad guys aren't that smart. Bad guys may not be highly intelligent, but they're very street smart. Mm -hmm. And you never can underrate that. Never. I would think some in some of those instances, people in 
that confuse intelligence and education. They do. And one can be very intelligent with no education. Mm-hmm. Or at least not well, traditional even, classroom education. Even, even general intelligence and street smarts, there's yeah. a difference. Yep. You get some guy that's been on the streets and knew a drug dealer and a prostitute by since the age of five. Yeah. They're going to have a level of street smarts that that us middle in or, or us middle class, you know, grew mm-hmm. up in the suburbs. People won't comprehend. Yeah. I grew up seven miles outside of a town of 4,000 people and everyone's house that I could see was related to me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This whole coming to the city and doing the cop thing has been an education a a few times and some of the stuff I've seen over the last year. I I came out of college. I mean, I grew up in every town USA. My wife says I grew up leave at the beaver. That's what she says. She said, you grew up just like the people on television came out of college, went into law enforcement, went to the jail. Yeah. Those first three months were such a culture shock to this middle-class white boy. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I look back on it now and I think I benefited starting in the jail mm-hmm. versus going right to the street. Oh, yeah. Because it gave me real insight to the people I was going to police. Mm -hmm. Because where I worked, except for a couple of years where I worked in a very upscale suburb that we were contracted to police, Mm -hmm. we called it the Emerald City. That's how nice it was. It's where all the General Motors executives and all the lawyers left. Except for a couple of years there, I worked in low income uh redneck black american type mm-hmm. places yeah. uh, i i don't want to call them disparaging plat you hate to use the term ghetto because it's yeah. so 1960s mm-hmm. but it was it was those kind of places is where i was a patrol officer yeah. and and a and a patrol supervisor so uh working the jail Prior to that was probably good for me. I will tell you that when I wore blue as a police officer, the answer was take them to jail. Mm-hmm. When you wear brown, you get to keep dealing with them after you take them oh, to jail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a different <laughs> world. I was in far more physical confrontations, fist type mm-hmm. fights yep. in the jail than I ever was on the street. And when I was in the jail in the 70s and 80s, we didn't have all these tools that they have now where they can put people in chairs or hit them with electricity. It was just you and your fists. Yeah. And that was it. And so I actually became, I don't want to call myself a boxer, but I I became pretty good with my fists, my elbows, and my knees because it's what I had. Um, But I, you know, if I was Lord Almighty of law enforcement, everything, training, all that, mm-hmm. and every cop in America in their probationary year, they would spend a month working in the jail. Yeah. Because I think it would be good for all of them mm-hmm. to meet their adversary in an environment other than just putting handcuffs on them. Yeah, it's a completely different animal when you're with them 24 seven. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. A different animal. Yeah. And I will preface, I am jail certified. I have worked in the jail as in going into helpless stuff. I have never been a full time assigned to the jail. Hmm. And uh, out of my 28 years on the sheriff's office, I had seven at different times mm-hmm. in the jail, working yeah. as a working as a jailer, and as a jail supervisor. Yeah, and it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. And I, I tell you though, when I I felt like I meant the most was when I was in prison transport, mm-hmm. and I was transporting them to prisons because they'll talk to you. Yeah. And uh, you swing through the drive through at McDonald's and get them a hamburger. They'll tell yeah. you anything. Yeah. 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 So yeah. extraditions can be interesting too. 
Yes. Well, their upbringing and how they viewed the world, mm -hmm. totally different than how yeah. you and I viewed the world. Yeah. Uh, extraditions can be a, can be a completely different experience as well. Sure. sure. Especially yeah. if you got to fly with them. Right. Yeah. I haven't had to personally fly with one, but I've been in the airport when there've been others being brought through. Uh, oh, I've flown. On. I've flown with more than my share. Uh, the yeah. ones I've been on were transported in a vehicle, but uh, yeah, you know, ground vehicle. But it's you know what you you get some strange looks when you stop at a rest area, and you walk a guy and use the bathroom, and you stand behind him with a double barrel shotgun stuck in his kidneys as he's doing his business, and yeah. people looking around you. And, everything and people but people figure it out pretty quick yeah i've got a great picture of uh i went to louisiana to get a guy because i had just read john bosenbecker's book on uh, uh frank hamer yep and when i got done reading the book i gave a copy of it to the sheriff who read it and we we're sitting in his office with the book on his desk when uh, one of our clerks walks in with an extradition from Bossier Parish, Louisiana. And we're like, we've got to go right past the ambush site to pick this guy up. We are personally taking this extradition. Yeah. Yeah. So we went and got him. We stopped by the Bonnie and Clyde ambush site on the way out there. We picked the guy up. We're bringing him back. And we stopped. How did you come back over the Mississippi River at Vicksburg? That's a very nice uh welcome center rest area there where you can look over the mississippi and everything and i've got a picture of me taking this guy down on the river walk because he was behaving himself uh to let him look at the mississippi river before he came back to georgia to go to go to prison again and as he's enjoying his nature walk i'm trucking along with him with a shotgun yeah. and uh yeah it, it was uh those are different experiences you just don't get doing doing other things yeah, very few people have those experiences. Yeah. Very few people transport prisoners. Yeah. You know, yeah. And as you say, their their outlook is completely different. I, uh, I learned a ton from talking to those people. Mm -hmm. A ton. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. well. How long, Any, have we, how long have we been going? We have been going an hour and 27 minutes. So I was just about wow. to ask, the: is there anything else on the on the whole agenda that we need to cover. Lee, we could probably continue to talk <laughs> about all this stuff. We were supposed to talk about combative pistol craft. I think we right. kind of buried away from that. But uh, yeah. no, I guess in closing, as now an observer of all this stuff, more than a, than a trainer in it, um, I see some of it going to the ridiculous but by the same token, I also see some really solid things being done right. in the area of, of pistol craft in general and combative mm -hmm. pistol craft. We are at a stage of life where we know how to do this now. Right. You know, when, when I started in the academy in 76, it was all point shooting stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it became the hard modern technique of the pistol. And then it was the John Shaw real hard isosceles. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of morphed to where we are now. I mean, yeah. even gun sight has, has softened from the weaver. It's now more push pull and stuff like that. So I, I think we've arrived at where we all know how to go about this with a few little variances. You know, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing serious. Right. And I think the people who are serious teachers uh, who guide the instructors who guide the practitioners. I think we have a consistent message and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. So we're headed in the right direction. If we can keep, oh, I'm just going to say it. If we can keep the slap dickery out of it, the stuff that, that goes mm -hmm. off the beaten path just to raise somebody's profile mm -hmm. or to make somebody some money, yeah. I think we're going to be doing the people that we really care about, the people that really want this. I think we're going to do them a serious service. We're, we're going to help them a lot. Yeah. Uh, the people that fall into every fad, maybe we can't help them at all. Right. I, I don't know. The people that see it, 
not as a serious skill to learn, but as a nice weekend experience. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can't help them, but but we're on the right track. And as as I fade away, as I move off with, you know, my mentors and my instructors, you know, um, we left. I think we left it in good hands. Guys like you and John Hearn and, and, and a lot of the other serious practitioners out there, we've, we've left it in good hands. Hopefully it will continue in that vein, in that path. And, and it continues on. Um, you know, I, I can live with a compensator and a mm-hmm. extended magazine if that will bring more people into the fold of shooting um, I, uh, I am cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I think it goes back to what you kind of let off with. It's what the students receive. It's how they see it. Yeah. It's what they get. And for the people that want to, they come to a class to compete for the prizes, the whatever stuff, and that's how they, okay, it gets them out, gets them doing it um and i will say there have been times where the training has been held captive to the so-called professionals and we wound up with things like new hall and other things and i think there has to be a mix of people that are driving pushing you know innovation you know, experimenting with techniques and everything, and that needs to be blended with the application and the side of the house. And we can, I hate to use the word coexist, but we can coexist with each other without having to be at each other's. Yes, yeah, I don't think you have to be a former special operator or a cop mm-hmm. to teach combative pistol craft. Right. I think there's people that are, are, are very capable of teaching it. Where those people fall into a trap is when they try to act or behave like something they're not. Right. Yeah, they're they're better off just saying, look, I'm just a serious student of this, just like you. Mm-hmm. I'm delivering a message. You know, when they try to dress or talk like they've been, you know, in Delta mm-hmm. Force, that's usually where they get into trouble. And, yeah. and I had some problems with some of my certified instructors over that. Yeah. When I would try to say, don't, mm-hmm. don't talk like that. Don't act like that. Don't, it's, it's not good. And, and it, 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 sometimes it was heard. Sometimes it wasn't, right. but that's where they fall into it. But you, you don't have to be a, a former SEAL to teach this. Right. As a matter of fact, some of those people teach some things because of their experiences right. that don't necessarily apply. Yeah. And you got to stay within your own context and your own skill set. Yeah. Uh, I have a vast amount of experience in working security for very large events. Security, mm-hmm. when I say security, I'm talking about everything the event planning, the tra- ingress, the egress, sure. all sure. that kind of stuff. I have a vast amount of experience in that. I don't have experience in deciding which guy gets to walk through the door of a church or not. And, you know, after the white settlement thing, and I could I had some people reach out and everything's like, you should be teaching this. Uh, uh-uh. I don't know how to do this without a badge. I, I just, but, but you've got all this. You can do that. No, you need to go to someone who has done that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have partnered with some people where I taught the shooting skills portion of it, and they taught, you know, the other things that went involved in with it. Sure. But it was, and one of those was, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine that is a retired Secret Service agent that it was running the security thing for his church, and he contacted me and said, I need a pro from Dover to do this shooting portion of it because they're not listening to me on a couple of things. If someone from not me tells them, maybe they'll listen and everything. And so I've done some of that stuff, but you know, I don't know how you decide who gets to sit in your well, congregation. Well, you know what? That may be 
the sign of a true teacher, someone that knows when they should do something. Right. A, a couple examples. It, it, I used to teach what I called critical space pistol, close mm-hmm. my version of close combat. And admittedly, I was never totally happy with it. When I took Rich Nance's class, the first thing I thought was, this is better. Yeah. This is better than what I do. So I shut mine down. And when anybody asked about that, mm-hmm. I'd say, take his. Yep. Uh, vehicle combatants. Mm-hmm. I quit doing it yep. because I was never happy, not with the content, but most facilities could not handle the aggressive way I wanted to teach it. Yeah. You know, bullets would skip. And so I quit teaching that because I couldn't teach it the way that I wanted to. The one time I was talked out of that didn't go well, yeah. as you well know. But I knew that if I couldn't do it the way it should be done or the way I wanted to do it, to just stop. Mm-hmm. And there is nothing wrong with that. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with saying, yeah, this is not my wheelhouse. Yeah. Go go see this guy. Mm-hmm. You're you're better off. Yeah, that's I had a guy reach out to me. He's like, when are you going to teach an you know, X content class? There's, I'm not. He's like, well, why not? Whatever. Cause I don't offer that class as I can refer you to people that will teach that. I and mean, I appreciate the fact that you want to take it from me, but there are people who are better suited to teach that right. curriculum. And it's, yeah, I'm happy with what I teach. There's and I refer to people. There's nothing yeah. wrong with knowing what yeah. your expertise is in. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would, I would never hesitate. Yeah. I can say a lot of bad things about me, but one of the good things I can tell you about me is that I would never hesitate to, to, yeah. to say no when I knew that I couldn't do it mm-hmm. either as well as someone else or right. up to a standard I wanted to achieve. Right. You know, and it, it's tempting because you could hang out the hang out the the class out there and make the money, and people not even really know the difference. But it's a lot of, you got to be people, true to yourself. A lot of people don't know if it's good or bad, uh, so you could just take the money. Yep. But a true teacher mm-hmm. knows if it's good or bad. My my consistent retort to people when like they tell me one of my class, this is the first class i've taken well this is both the best and the worst class you have ever taken then that's true yeah that's very true yeah yeah and uh because it it, unless you have context it's it's yeah i hope that if you you take other stuff you'll still consider this to be a good class if you consider it that way now exactly uh, Exactly. there's been stuff that when i didn't know any better that i took a class and was like oh okay yeah this was right then as i got more experience in an area going wow that other training that i went to was really 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 bad and uh but you know you got to you've got to have experience to be able to look at and to be able to make those those value judgments but uh i know you keep saying that you are retired and I know you keep saying you're transitioning to that observation. I will point out to you that you have proven that you can run a class there in the Dayton area and that people will come to you. That was, that was very gratifying. It really was. Yeah. So you don't have to do the whole traveling thing. You can a few yeah. times a year, run one there in, in the Dayton area and people will come to you. Well, James and Corey Cocking at Motion SST, mm-hmm. they are great folks. They have a nice facility. You need yeah. to teach a class sure. there. Sure. Yeah. And I know John goes there I and mean, he's been there several times. Yeah. They're, they're and, good folks. I, I, it is very telling that I have never heard a negative thing said about them. No, never. No. And that no, says no. a lot. They, they are, they are with, I can't say they're the most, mm-hmm. but they're some of the most cooperative hosts I've ever had. And yeah. they they have a nice a nice setup there. It's, it's actually in their truly in their backyard. Yeah, they have a, they have a nice setup. Right, and you know, as you say, you're becoming an observer of things. Well, please don't be afraid to share those observations with 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 the community. 
because I think well, your insight. I appreciate you having me on because uh, I, I do consider myself retired. I'm not in a hurry to hold any other classes. I'm not even in a hurry to like point things out. I'm just kind of sitting back and I'm just kind of watching things and taking note of stuff. And YouTube's an interesting vehicle Yeah, there. You got to look, but there's some good stuff on there, but there's a whole lot more craziness than, than, than I'd like to see. I've mentioned this in a couple of venues, but I don't recall if I've discussed it on, on the show or not. I somehow found the whole genre of homesteading videos on YouTube. I don't know how I stumbled into it, but I did. I've seen a couple of those. And it there's a common theme. It's this young couple or, you know, starting to get into middle age, whatever. They give up their corporate IT jobs, corporate whatever, and they move from some city somewhere and they go out and buy a couple of acres in the country somewhere. And they go and like last week they bought a goat and a dairy cow. And now they're producing videos, how to videos and stuff like, I just, I just bought my first hit of livestock last week. Here are the 10 things you need to know. And that's kind of stuff. And some of these channels have tens and thousands or even hundreds of thousands of followers. And I, I, I just, I can't help it. I keep trying to find new channels and go through and watch their videos and I compare them to things that I see in the firearms world and that people that have been to two classes and now they call themselves an instructor. And, you know, and they're throwing it out, out there. And I was watching one video this week of a couple from, I think it's a Portland, and they bought some acreage in Kentucky. And the guy was going around giving a farm tour. And... He shows their steer that they are raising for beef. And it is a Jersey steer. Folks, the Jersey breed of cattle is a very tiny breed of dairy cattle. That was originated on the Jersey Isles off the coast of England. They're tiny because they lived on an island. And the importation of any type of other live, you know, cattle onto that island was prohibited because they wanted to make sure the breed. Say, so they Jersey cattle produce very high butterfat content milk. That's not what you slaughter for your beef. Uh, I believe you. I got nothing. I don't. You know. Uh, you, you know what. My wife may have had one of the best observations on this whole YouTube thing. Mm -hmm. When I was running the business and I was putting those out, I didn't put out Hollywood quality videos because Darren and I just did them with iPhones on the range. We, we did them the best we could. We were always truthful. Yeah. I tried to put out good how-to stuff. And if we got 10,000 views, we thought we did well. Mm -hmm. And we did because Lee, as you know, my classes yeah. were always filled up months in yeah. advance. So I reached the right people. Thus, it was a success. Mm -hmm. But my wife was watching one of them and she was watching some other gun videos and she looked over at me and she says, you know, if you would have just gotten some young girl and put her in a tight T-shirt mm -hmm. and had her do what you did, yep. you'd have gotten 100,000 views. Yep. And I thought, there it is. Mm -hmm. YouTube in a nutshell. Yep. And it's funny. It's, I saw one earlier today that the whole thing was, if you're tired of your rat race life, you should just buy some land and start farming folks. My family were farmers and we still have the land, but we all go somewhere that pays us every two weeks and we don't have yeah. to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I could go right now. I know. Tomorrow, just, I could go back to the farm and start it up. You if just I said to. it. They're not farmers. Yeah. They're influencers. Yeah. They're, they're, making... you, they're YouTube personalities. Yeah. You go out and find somebody that's 15 to 20. Yeah. And ask them what they want to be. I'll bet you half of them will say YouTube influencers. Yeah. 
because you don't have to really like work for a living. Yeah. And, and like one of these channels, he's got like 800 and something thousand followers. And I'll watch every video he puts out because he does some very interesting things. Yeah. And the guy's pretty handy as a whodunit, you know, you know, fix it kind of guy and everything yeah. like that. But if you took his income away from this YouTube channel, there's no way in the world he's making a living on his farm. He would starve to death. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I kind of think about that, you know, to put it back in the context of the show is, is who are you taking your cues from? And if it's all about the being the influencer, the, the clicks, the likes, the views and everything, look at what else is behind, behind it. Um, and of course, I know I'm old man yelling at clouds to a, to a 20 something. Yeah. But you know, I tend to bounce stuff off of you and Tom and Ken Hackathorn and it guys of your era. I don't bounce stuff off of some guy with a big YouTube channel. And well, you know, my wife started out reading blogs and watching YouTube channels of women who did like home decorating and or makeup and that kind of stuff. And she said, you know, they would start out, they were some guy's wife and they were doing it in their bathroom. Yeah. And as they got more popular and more money, yeah. they suddenly had a mansion yeah. and they were getting all this uh, plastic surgery and they suddenly lost all this weight and they yeah. were wearing all this different clothing. Yeah. And, you know, that's right. There it is. It, it wasn't about them putting out the information that you found mm -hmm. valuable. Yeah. It became about them making money. Yeah. Because they well, found, you know, I can make big money and not really have to work all that hard. Yeah. I said this out of my very own mouth to someone this week or this past week in response to something I belong very much what we're talking about right now. I said, you know, anyone can have a podcast. That doesn't give the fact that they have a podcast any credits. Folks, I'm sitting in my kitchen right now doing this. The fact that they have the Weems Guy Show podcast, that shouldn't give me any credence whatsoever. If you find value in the information that is being shared on this show, that's the value of it. Not the fact that I have a show. But there's so many people because you have a show think you know what you're talking about. Right. And you do. You do know what you're talking about. But there's a lot of people out there that have podcasts and stuff mm -hmm. and got the foggiest idea what they're talking about, especially when it comes to technical skills. Mm -hmm. I looked it up last week. There are currently over 3.2 million podcasts out there. Wow. 3.2 million. When I started this show, it was 2.7 million. They're all trying to make money, too. Yeah. They're all trying to make money. They all want to be Joe Rogan. All right. Y'all stand fast for just a second, and I will tell you exactly how much money this podcast has made so far this year. <laughs> $12.47. I can't. Well, I'm not able to get to it on my phone. It was just a fuzz over $700. $700. It then like went over $700 this past week. Well, then you must be doing it for some other reason than profit. Gee. Right. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I get it. And yeah, it's this started out as I got to get a little bit of something out there. So that when people Google my name, they don't find me talking about Rex in 2016 yeah. and the like. And it has grown into something else. I think we're kind of, we probably kind of run our course and we're starting to go down the backside of the mountain. Uh, but, uh, yeah. whether you, know, you have to do that stuff, if, if you're, if you're, if you're going to be a trainer and you want to draw students, mm -hmm. you have to let people know you're there. When I decided to do handgun combatives, I didn't know what Facebook was. Yeah. I didn't know what YouTube was. Mm -hmm. I knew what websites were, but I had no idea. If it wouldn't have been for my son and son-in-law, I would have been lost there. Yeah. They're the ones that helped me get that up and running. Yeah. yeah. Well, you got it. You got something like that. 
Yeah. Well, folks, Dave and I could keep talking to each other all night. All night. I know yeah. I've seen us do it. <laughs> we, we we've do probably it. we've probably lost most everybody by now. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some people on the on the podcast side will stay all the way through the end because they listen to it in their cars. They're driving back and right. forth, whatever. Right. YouTube, in and out. About five to seven minutes, I've been told. Uh, right now, I can tell you, I can get to that on my phone. Um, we're averaging right at 20 minutes per view. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, it went so long. Hey, yeah. my Buffalo Trace is gone. <laughs> It's time to end this anyway. Yeah. Well, when I say 20 yeah. minutes per view, there may be people that watch for 20 minutes. They stop. They come back later. Okay. Watch and they stop. Well, okay. Uh, on the podcast feed, like I say, it's people listening in their cars, out walking their dog and everything else. Yeah. Uh, Again, I'm sorry about my voice. I don't really sound like this. Uh, and uh, well, well, Dave, I, I appreciate all the, all the wisdom over the years, all the time that you've taken to mentor me and to help and in the fact that you've you know even put up with me dragging her into stuff and, and well, uh, i'm glad i helped you get to the success that you've enjoyed if i had a small part in that i'm i i'm very happy well i would say that you've had more than a small part in it and well, good. I, I, I thank you for that and what i hope is going to be a continuing uh friendship and mentorship oh i and, i don't think there's any doubt there Thank you. And, and to the audience, we know that your most important asset is your time. Thank you for choosing to spend it with us.